Stop it! Stop it! Please! I beg you! In the age of the anti-hero, among the Lannisters and the Underwoods, a Clockwork Orange's hero, Alex, stands out as a prototype and prime example of a strange but fascinating subset of the anti-hero type. We like to call it the glamorous psychopath. What we were after now was the old surprise visit. That was a real kick, and good for laughs and lashings of the old ultra-violent. Unlike with other villains, in the case of the glamorous psychopath, it's not the backstory or some justification like cancer or abuse or oppression that explains behavior and keeps us grudgingly sympathetic towards the horrible hero. With Alex, it's his pure elegance and the feeling that he's somehow superior to all others around him. We're fascinated because he's smarter, more cultured, and does what he does better than anyone else. And in the years since Clockwork Orange, we've been seduced by more examples of the glamorous psychopath type. Catherine Trammell from Basic Instinct, Catherine and Sebastian from Cruel Intentions, Hannibal Lecter of Silence of the Lambs and NBC's TV version Hannibal, The Wolf of Wall Street's Jordan Belfort, and American Psycho's Patrick Bateman. And the image is so popular, it's seeped out of movies and TV into the rest of our visual culture. From music videos to fashion shoots, as the unremitting violence of our entertainment proves, we are an aggressive species. But society mostly requires us to suppress our violent urges. So the fanciful glamorous psychopath allows us to vicariously experience a cathartic release for this aggressive impulse, while remaining just surreal enough to make us feel it's all safely fictional. So let's look closer at how Burgess's story and Kubrick's images, music, and direction work together in Clockwork Orange to elevate Alex from a teenage thug to a cult anti-hero, whose antics we guiltily enjoy. I've been doing nothing I shouldn't, sir. The militants have nothing on me, brother. Sir, I mean. Alex is highly sophisticated and cultured, embodying a civilized intelligence that sets him above and apart from others around him. As Burgess himself has said, Alex is a human being endowed, even over-endowed, with three essential attributes of man. Quote, he rejoices in articulate language and even invents a new form of it. How are thou, thou globby bottle of cheap, stinking chip oil? Come and get one in the yarbles! He loves beauty, which he finds in Beethoven's music above everything. Oh, it was gorgeousness and gorgeosity made flesh. He is aggressive. Alex is obviously more intelligent and well-spoken than his droogs and the other characters in the movie. This sight, if I may call it such, does not become you, oh my little brothers. As I am your droog and leader, I'm entitled to know what goes on, eh? <laughs> he quotes, he sings, he dances, he's ridiculously imaginative, and his daydreams are humorous, as well as vile. His speech and tastes are refined. He's also the only character in the movie who has a true appreciation for art. He loves Beethoven as much as he loves violence. And I felt all the melancholy little hairs on my plot standing endwise, because I knew what she sang. It was a bit from The Glorious Ninth by Ludwig van. Interestingly, NBC's version of Hannibal Lecter, another cultured, elegant psychopath, at one point cooks a human leg to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, one of Alex's favorites. On top of all these characteristics, Alex is played by Malcolm McDowell, who can't help but be charming in a creepy Ramsey Bolton kind of way. In short, Kubrick presents Alex as more human than any other character in the movie. There was me, that is Alex, and my three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie, and Dim. Alex narrates the story, so this privileges his perspective. This is the real weepy and like tragic part of the story beginning, oh my brothers and only friends. But it's not just that. He narrates in a language of his own invention called Nadsat. Nadsat is a mix of Old English, rhyming slang, and anglicized Russian. Happy Polly Lodges. I had something of a pain in the gulliver, so I had to sleep. Irvin Welsh points out that this language does more than simply show off Alex's and Burgess's linguistic talents. The Durango 95 purred away real horror show. A nice, warm, vibrate feeling all through your gutty woods. Alex's lingo forces us to struggle to understand him, grasping at recognizable words and syntax to complete his sentences. The shock sending my dada beating his bruised and groovy rookers against unfair bog in his heaven. 
So Alex quite literally forces us to hang on his every word. Language reflects how we see the world, and in A Clockwork Orange, we can understand Alex's world on his terms, or not at all. This unique narration highlights his nature as a true individual, which, despite the need to protect society from him, makes it somehow heartbreaking when he's deprived of this individuality. Kubrick made sure to use every ounce of set to show us more of Alex's character. The room he created for Alex has a cult status of its own, one fan even spent six months recreating Alex's bed cover, which, by the way, is designed to look like citrus fruits cut in half. Through the decor, we see Alex's idiosyncratic sense of style and his appreciation for music and art. Also, movie Alex has a pet snake named Basil, which symbolizes his sexual and violent instincts, but also shows he has the heart to care for a living creature. Where's my snake? Alex! What do you want? It's past eight, Alex. You don't want to be late for school, son. In the book, Alex is only 17. McDowell playing Alex was 28. But thanks to the script and Kubrick's set choices, he still seems very juvenile. He uses a lot of childish words of his own invention. There's a strange fella sitting on the sofa, munchy munching lumpticks of toast. And he decorates his prison cell wall with a collage of clippings and photos, reminding us that he's really just a grumpy teen, a kid who skips school, demands to have a lock installed on his door, and cries when his parents upset him. Next to his evil hobbies, the childishness seems perverse, but still, it makes us inclined to cut the kids some slack. Roger Ebert points out that the visual language Cooper created for the movie encourages us to see the world as Alex does. Kubrick sometimes uses a wide-angle lens, which at close range distorts the sides of the image. As we can see here, objects in the center of the screen look normal, but those on the edges tend to slant upward and outward, becoming bizarrely elongated. Kubrick often places Alex at the center of a wide-angle shot, or uses a standard lens on Alex alone, so that he's the only one who's almost never distorted. As Ebert puts it, quote, A visual impression is built up during the movie that Alex, and only Alex, is normal. We put you right. You're getting the best of treatment. We never wished you harm. But there are some who did, and do. In the world of A Clockwork Orange, Alex is not alone in his delinquent activities. There are other bands of criminals just as violent, if less stylish. And Alex's merry band of sadists prowl a world that's just as morally bankrupt as they are. Mr. Deltoid is vile, the prison guards are incompetent, the victims are cartoonish and unpleasant. You little... Bastard. Dr. Brodsky and his colleagues, while curing others of cruelty, obviously enjoy the spectacle of Alex getting beaten up and humiliated on stage. Unlike all these hypocritical characters who pretend to be good and socially responsible, Alex, at least, is honest with the audience from the start, which helps to get us on his side. I was small on my face. I walked down. Most of the dialogue scenes in the movie are taken directly from Burgess's text, but a few scenes have been cut or altered. Interestingly, all of the changes from book to movie make Alex seem less horrible and the world around him more horrible. Alex's first three assaults are cut, so is the murder Alex commits in prison. Kubrick glossed over certain especially incriminating details. For example, the girls Alex meets at the record shop were no more than 10 years old, according to the book. And in the book, Alex brutally rapes them. In the movie, the girls are consenting adults, and the sex is, if anything, comical. The skip frame high speed motion making the girls and Alex look like wind up toys. Most importantly, Kubrick completely excluded the last chapter in the book, in which Alex, wiser and calmer at the ripe old age of 18, starts to reevaluate his evil ways. Kubrick dismissed it as, quote, unconvincing and inconsistent with the style and intent of the book. Instead, he chose to end the movie on Alex's return to his natural violent state. By ending the movie this way, Kubrick seems to say, Alex is violent again, and all is well with the world. I was cured, all right. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. Kubrick shoots the ultraviolence in a way that makes it feel unreal and distant. The violent scenes are often set to music, or slowed down, and this, along with the wide camera lens, breaks the illusion of reality. 
Alex and his crew are dressed in matching white suits. Their movements are choreographed. At a certain point, the whole thing starts to look like a zesty dance more than anything. Kubrick's eye for beauty manages to make even sexual assault look perversely aestheticized. Other scenes with their exaggerated movement and sound effects are almost slapstick, no more frightening than a Tom and Jerry cartoon. The beautified, choreographed violence is what made critics of the film especially angry, and it's what makes A Clockwork Orange enduringly controversial and upsetting to many. But actually, most of Alex's violence is shot in a way that makes it allegorical and easier to stomach, compared to the hyper-real brutality that's commonplace today. So it's almost as if we're not meant to interpret the violence as real or part of our world. A Clockwork Orange has a lot in common with a fairy tale, especially in its deliberately heavy use of coincidence and plot symmetry. Alex is assaulted by the same three victims that he assaults, the homeless person, Dim, and the author. This fearful symmetry is especially evident in the scene with the author torturing Alex. Here, Kubrick uses the same long pull-away shot he used to introduce us to Alex in the opening scene of the film, so the visual repetition places the author into Alex's original mindset. The fable-like mythical quality of A Clockwork Orange distances us from the story, because it signifies that what we're viewing is an allegory for aspects of our own lives, like our individualism, aggression, and frustration set in a world that's removed from our own. Kubrick built a world for this film that's recognizable but also weirdly grotesque, just like A Clockwork Orange. The costume design, casting, and sets are peppered with details that make the whole thing seem like a perverse fairy tale. Alex's mom is a wispy old lady, crying quietly into a Kleenex, but she wears patent leather dresses and colorful wigs. Both the young delinquents and respectable opera singers seem to go to the same Karova milk bar, where they all presumably squirt drugged milk into their glasses out of plexiglass breasts. The Clockwork Orange world ends up looking like a funhouse mirror reflection of our world, rather than a real dystopian future. The central idea of Burgess's book has to do with the question of free will. Choice. The boy has no real choice, has he? Is it better to be bad of one's own free will, or to be good because we're forced to through scientific brainwashing? Burgess points out that when something cold and mechanical, like scientific conditioning or state oppression, is forced upon a living thing, the result is perverse and senseless, again, like a clockwork orange. Kubrick's adaptation was largely very faithful to Burgess's book, but he understood that in the film, quote, the dramatic impact had principally to do with the extraordinary character of Alex. Audiences and critics alike were horrified by Alex when Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of Anthony Burgess's novel first came out in 1971. The New Yorker called Kubrick a bad pornographer, while Roger Ebert criticized the film for pretending to oppose the police state and forced mind control while really just enjoying the nastiness of the hero Alex. But it's precisely this nastiness that keeps the film's cult status alive and growing today. So by the end, we've been seduced by Alex and by Kubrick into actually feeling relieved when Alex returns to his violent state. For a while, watching this film, we enjoy seeing things Alex's way, with no decency to hold us back. His antics make us feel powerful and offer an antidote to the anxiety of our own social structures. Burgess wrote A Clockwork Orange with the citizens of huge industrial cities in mind, like New York and London, home to people whose work is often terribly routine, their food and clothing and home standardized. When your life ticks along like a Woolworth's alarm clock, characters like Alex can offer a vicarious escape from all that, allowing us to briefly fantasize about being some exceptional, out-of-this-world creature who ignores the rules imposed by society and is good enough to get away with it. Mm -hmm.